Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Great to be on. <laughs> yeah, mate. I, I've been following you on LinkedIn for a little while. I really loved your post. It's obvious that off the bat, you know what you're talking about, being there, done that, um, just by the specificity of what you're talking about and just found your history really interesting. And one of them caught my eye in particular, which was the, the partnerships. Uh, I think you did a couple of posts on Uber and a couple other things. And I was just like, oh, wow, that's so true. And I think it's, it's one of these areas that I've covered before from more of that sort of affiliate online partnership -y angle, um, more of a content partnership or sales partnership play at a, at a more sort of direct B2C level, but I was just thinking, I really want to talk to someone about massive partnerships, you know, this step change growth partnerships that you do uh, with big enterprises or big brands. And I, I read some of your stories and anyway, uh, here we are. Yeah, great. great. It's, a, it's a fascinating area, so good to talk about it. Yeah, well, no one talks about it. So, um, and especially I think marketers, they kind of get stuck in this marketing communications field. And, um, but before that, you did mention the, the skill of anyone, especially in tech to pitch your idea in 90 seconds, it's a really good exercise. So over to you in 90 seconds, what does smart token labs do? Hey, we might token smart. <laughs> That's hey, pretty short. Just for, I'll, give you, I'll give you another 85 seconds. So, okay. so basically we're an open source software development company. Um, we're a 40 person team distributed around the world. Um, we're building a smart, a programmable smart token interface to build bridges between web two and web three. So we're basically making it easier for large web two brands to enter into web three and web three use cases to sort of tap back into the scale of, of web two um, through products like brand connector and brand extender. Okay. I like it. Um, what is web one, two, three, just really quickly. I mean, there's, there's all the cliched versions of it. Um, it's just new iterations of the internet. Um, you know, well, just people like put a decalmation line in here to say, Hey, that's, that's old. And now we're two and now we're three. Uh, but you know, literally generally it's a progression, right? It's yeah, it's a, it's a progression. It's an evolution. It's new technology that underpins it. It's um, I think where we are today is a more participatory, more, you know, on the cusp of a more participatory, more open internet than we've ever had before. Um, one where where consumers and users potentially own their data, they own a stake in the things that they're participating participating in. They they help creating to build. So it's a really fascinating iteration of the internet. You know. Read one was for me, web one was kind of like websites and web two was mobile was the mobile internet and, you know, mobile apps and that the transformation between sort of out of, out of stage one, where we all thought it was dot coms and then it became something much different. And then stage two, we had the mobile internet and the, and the explosion of mobile apps. And we never really knew what they were going to be until we started to see businesses like, you know, Uber and, and Airbnb emerge and these marketplace based businesses. And, you know, Web3, we're kind of at that coming out stage where it's it's not really, you know, generative art based um, NFP, NFTs and it's not DeFi 1.0. We're not quite sure what it's going to be, but it's going to be super interesting. Yeah, I have some specific experience in, uh, you know, 3D modeling uh, with, with a, a firm that I did that was sort of taking e-commerce into 3D modeling instead of dealing with like 2D images. And it was just such a step change, I think, for a lot of the orthodox e-commerce world um, that I then thought, oh, well, if we're going to go into this metaverse sort of Web3 virtualization kind of world, um, surely the first step would be to have the 3D model of your products. And it was just amazing how many firms didn't do that. There was this sort of orthodox view of photo shoot, static 2D images, maybe some kind of video, um, but that's about it. And I just thought, well, you know, everyone's talking about, you know, there's metaverses, but you need to have 3D assets to do anything. So why don't you have them? And it was, a, it was a strange sort of moment. And that's when I sort of found out that some of this is just lip service. And um, I think there's some interesting firms doing uh, really interesting stuff. Uh, any in particular that you can talk about? Or? I just see all that as early stage experimentation. So, um, you know, the simple truth is that we, the, the, the first mass adoption sort of like major consumer or business application that, that truly levers, leverages, you know, blockchain, smart contracts, tokenization hasn't, hasn't arrived yet. So, we don't have that um, that thing that sort of moves us beyond innovators and early adopters. So yeah. at the moment, we're sort of like, you know, when they're in, we're largely in the analogy and metaphor stage. We're, we're like the information superhighway, right? We're trying to make sense through use cases that nobody can really understand. Um, the things that the things that you know, and 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 it's kind of a unique beast, Web three, because of the tokenization element of it. So the the ability for people to trade. 
you know, you know, they're incentivized to be part of these communities and incentivized to be part of these projects and incentivized to be part of these protocols, which is kind of like distorting the whole thing. Um, mm -hmm. The things, but the things that I'm super interested in is, you know, there's, there's just no question that community action, um, t p people, people will mobilize around things that they care about in ways that's never occurred before. And that will happen through the governance and the incentive possibilities of tokenization. So um, the things that excite me the most are things like, you know, Climate DAO and Earth DAO. And, you know, it's basically the ability to um, mobilize as a group of people, take a stake in something, have, have decision-making input and, you know, to do things. I mean, Climate DAO in its, in its simplest form is about um, buying up carbon credits to, to make it too expensive to pollute. And, you know, that's, that's an early stage experiment that was part of DeFi 2.0, which I'm not exactly sure where that's at today, but it was a way for you to mobilize, you know, alongside your friends and put a, put a stake in something where you did generate a financial return, but you're actually doing things that essentially governments couldn't do. That, you know, they're, they're basically, it's a no code solution to, to set up, you know, these um, Web3 based project, create, build a DAO, organize a community, um, organize the tokenomics, you know, and they're doing doing fascinating things in, in mental health and climate. It's it's that stuff where I think we're going to see the true change of the world. All the brand stuff's interesting as well. The new business models are interesting, and it's all coming. hasn't landed yet, but um, that's what that's what sort of gets me up in the morning. And just for everyone else, like DAO's decentralized autonomous organization. Yes, organizations. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I've seen the same thing. Um, I think communities were sort of the first step. I mean, I'm doing this for a client right now where we're building our community and then the community is like a feedback loop for then product iterations and packagings and gestion, right? Which is generally used to be a pretty static sort of, uh, process with marketing in terms of you do formalized market research, you know, then you have an internal discussion around it. And obviously we all know what happens there. The politics gets involved and then, you know, maybe the company then doesn't really express the needs of the market in a purest sense. But I suppose, you know, getting rid of some of that, Disament, sorry, that politics and intermediaries in that decision making process, you get a more pure expression of like wants and uh, market wants, and then you know what the, the company can kind of produce to satisfy those wants. Uh, and that's kind of where I see these things kind of like coming into it, and, and perhaps you know the infrastructure su such as the you know the company you're working for now is sort of a, a leg up to that transition from old business models and new ways of doing things. So um, it's exciting. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, and it, yeah, and at a commercial level, I mean, it's super interesting, you know, like the, I, I worked at Uber for a couple of years and, you know, Uber's the classic example, just at a, at a business innovation level, you know, where the drivers should have had a bigger stake in the, in, in the success of Uber, you know, they, they should have been effectively held, held a stake that, you know, they, that, that reflected the contribution that they made. Now that wasn't, that's not possible in, in a traditional organization with, I mean, at some level, maybe it would have been, but it just wasn't the way things were done. But, you know, it would be possible with a new version of um, marketplace businesses today, both on the demand and the supply side, you're going to see them tokenized and you're going to be able to see participants who early stage, just like creators, you know, early yep. stage participants who help drive the um, liquidity on each side of the marketplace will, will have a stake in it and they will benefit from, you know, from, from accelerating the growth. You did mention Uber, and this is where the sort of partnership thing came from. Um, you said something that's really interesting. You said enterprise partnerships for startups are like gold dust. They're flaky and rare. So mm -hmm. what do you mean by that? And what exactly, if you had to define a partnership, what is it in your, your mind? Yeah, good question. So um, they're flaky and rare because small companies partnering with large companies successfully is, um, is exceedingly rare. It doesn't normally, it doesn't normally work out. So, um, I, and why I is that, tend though? to think of them, well, just because they're incredibly complex things to pull off and small companies don't know how big companies operate and big companies believe that they're market makers for small companies and big companies have lots of layers of bureaucracy and um, small companies don't know how to contract with big, big companies. And there's, there's just, there's so many reasons, right? <laughs> um, so it's, it, it is like gold dust, but, but if you can pull it off, it can, it can be a market maker for you. So I typically see, um, so, so, my career, you know, I worked, I've worked across a range of different disciplines, in, including sales and marketing and partnerships and partnerships has been, you, you mentioned before, like affiliate and referral, like the, the sort of more performance media service. I know you've got a lot of experience in that. I, I've touched the, touched the edges of that, but that's not really my core experience area. It is these sort of 
partnership intersection with big and small companies. So I think typically there's um, there's three types. There's there's brand partnerships, growth partnerships, and then sort of product slash distribution partnerships. Um, they're the ones that I've had most experience in. And I've seen seen around the traps. The the growth the the brand partnership is your typical you know innovation type of partnership with a where a larger legacy business will look to sidle up alongside a a sexy startup with with a bit of brand equity and um, do some stuff to demonstrate that they're interesting and they're cool. Um, and and you know and they may and they may and they maybe it may go a level or two below that, but it's typically operates at a fairly superficial level where it's sort of announcement driven and PR driven and sort of some projects and some toes in the water, but it doesn't really deliver material growth. So and they're, they're, that's where most of them start and finish. To be perfectly honest, okay. Um, Growth partnerships are, you know, where you, maybe you're closer to a sort of scale up. Um, so you can still be like, I still class, you know, when I worked at Facebook and at Uber, we were still um, scale ups alongside, you know, companies like Westpac and Optus and Telstra and um, Microsoft, who are, who are the, the companies and, and IGA that I, that I partnered with. We were nevertheless seen as the, the smaller player in the, in the relationship, just to given where, where the business were. So those sort of growth partnerships are typically sort of based around, you know, customer acquisition. And, you know, in Uber's case, it might be trying to, you know, recruit more drivers or re recruit more riders. You've both got sort of overlapping customer bases. You know, Optus might have 12 million customers in Australia. Uber might have 1.5 million. Um, there's a sort of overlap there. There's a benefit exchange, but ultimately you're both, you know, that Optus might be trying to deliver benefits to their customers and improve retention by, by giving them cool loyalty perks. And, and Uber might be super focused on, you know, acquiring new customers. Though, those ones typically fall into two buckets. They're either binding or non-binding. And um, what, what I mean by that is that there are commercially binding terms or there are not. And it's, it's, it's amazing how many of them are not. So, yeah. and, they're the, and basically that's, that's why 95% of those don't work either. So unless yeah. unless you enter into a growth partnership with a, with a large corporate, and you know I made this post the other day that at Uber, the um, the edict from the business development I worked in the global BD team and we we were only responsible for these big trajectory changing growth partnerships, and the edict was if you couldn't if you couldn't fit the entire deal on a BlackBerry screen, then it wasn't going to be a, it wasn't gonna, it wasn't a real deal. And what they meant by that was you could reduce an you know an, a two year partnership with a with a bank down to you know two or three core commercial terms. They're going to deliver this many riders, and if they don't, they'll pay this much per rider that they're short. We're going to deliver them this this, and if we don't, we're going to pay them that. Right, and everything else is just noise. Right, so you can have. And, and typically you'll have these really long winded agreements and you'll talk about shared values and visions and, and, and what the announcement's going to look like. You'll even have a really detailed program of work, you know, where they'll, they'll talk to like how many email sends they're going to do and how many SMSs they're going to do and how many times they've touched their customer base and all this stuff. And the, 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 the reality is that, you know, all of that always changes. And typically the partnership teams that negotiate these deals don't actually control the marketing calendar of work. They'll they'll check in with the CRM team, but you know th there's all these reasons why those things don't work. So at some level, like we never cared what they put in the activity schedule. We just cared whether they'd pay us for every rider they fell short. Most it reminds me. You know, it reminds me of um, is it Charlie Munger? It's like show me the incentives and I'll show you the outcome. It reminds me very much yeah, yeah. of that, that quote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like when you get, when you get an agency or any sort of thing, and you're it's all based on this promise of a future state. And I'm like, well, really, it's just all talk until that happens, and it either occurs or it doesn't. And that's kind of what people want. They don't really care how you get there, as long as it's not damaging to both brands. You know, everything else is just like, well, it doesn't matter. You know, how we achieve the outcome. Well, that's exactly right. And you know, I'll give you another example from Uber. You know, I partnered with um, with a very large insurance company, and. Their, their brand essence, their brand platform is, is innovation, right? So they, they consider themselves the innovator in the market. And they were the first to offer rideshare insurance in Australia to drivers before wow. Uber was regulated, right? So they legitimately were innovative at a product level. And they came to us and wanted to partner. And um, basically, we just went straight to the heart of it, right? And we said, if you want to partner with us, you're making a statement that you believe in ridesharing. 
okay? We, we know, for example, right, that you're spending $5 million a year on taxis. So we will require you to convert in the first 12 months, 50% of that to Uber travel for business. Mm-hmm. So you need to, you need, you need and, and if you don't do it, if you don't spend 2.5 with this, you need to write us a check for whatever you're short. Wow. Right? So it's pretty pointed, but you know, there can, before that, right. There's so many, there's such broad statements about innovation and partnership and with same vision and they've done the product, right? So it's like, look, it's, and, and, and basically what we're saying is you're going to, you're going to write a check to us for $2.5 million, but you're going to save 30% of what you would have spent with taxis and you're, and, and you're going to have these other benefits. You're going to be able to track the travel because of how the business works. And you're going to have actually more visibility of, of where your staff travel. So there's all these benefits. So if you actually believe in this, then you'll have no problem signing that. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. So um, then what, what is in a partnership then? Um, we did mention some of these affiliates sort of online uh, referral and affiliate programs and that kind of thing. You know, we, we all know the names like partner stack and all those kind of things, um, which is kind of quite sort of digital acquisition and preference by a lot of, uh, you know, digital online sort of only products. Um, you know, but, but yeah. then there's the sort of stage that you're talking about, which is, you know, what I'd call more enterprise level partnerships or, or, or traditional partnerships in the true sense of the word or strategic partnerships. Um, you know, is there a delineation there between the two camps or is there something that's like, a, you know, a collab on Instagram that people call a JV or a partnership, but it's just really, you know, someone's sharing an account yeah. and tagging someone like, where do we draw the line here? Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So, so, I mean, I, I my, my ex- experience is I, there was a third, third bucket of partnership oh, yeah, with right. product based instrument product-based partnerships where you're integrating. So that's, that's basically Uber being integrated into Google maps, for example, yep. or, yep. um, you know, Miro being integrated into zoom, those yep. sorts of partnerships, right? They, 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 they can have huge. So those three categories of partnerships can all deliver trajectory change and growth is my experience. If you get them right, even the brand ones, even the, the first category, if, 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 if trust and credibility is, is what you need to solve for, then they can still do it. Um, the, the small, oh, the, the other ones that I, I sort of bucket all those other ones, like influencer things and, um, affiliates and referrals as sort of like media deals, performance deals. Yeah. So they're super important. Um, and you've got to get them right, but, um, and there's brand considerations around that where your brand shows up, but I, I sort of see them all in that sort of performance, performance area. So they don't quite fit into this, this bucket of stuff that, you know, one of the exceptions, um, I'll stop overusing the, the Uber example, but, but Uber was, you know, part of their playbook was um, how they went to market when they land, when they turned up in Australia and they turned up in Sydney and they turned up in Melbourne. They did these, um, they had this partnership model at a city-based level where they did these super interesting and innovative on-demand stunts. So you could get Messina ice cream on demand from your Uber on a, on a special day. There was the um, um, the puppies thing like, as well. You could, I remember ordering this, yeah, there was like yeah. cats or puppies that would come to your office as well. Yeah, yeah, there was there was a um, I think that was the guide dogs. I think the yes. Sydney team did that. Yes. Um, and yeah, it was pet a puppy and you know show your yeah. support for. I think, I think that was guide dogs, but um, that, that's a really good example. So so Uber was famous, and the city teams ran all these, and they did an unbelievable job. And it was part of a playbook when they entered into a city. They would do these sort of like it was part of you know it was the brand essence was kind of cool, innovative, fun, and yep. all of those stunts delivered on that messaging. Um, and there's a PR know, on the back so, end of it so, potentially as well, some social media PR sort of like secondary effects, yeah, obviously. PR on the back of it, that, yeah, yeah. That, that's right. And so the gap between those and a trajectory changing growth partnership is, is one that's going to deliver you, you know, that's going to fundamentally change the directory of three parts of the business, either, um, the, de- the demand side of the business, the riders, the mm-hmm. supply side of the business, the drivers, or, or the cost structure of the business. So, and that they're operating at a whole, at, you know, they're aiming to operate at a whole nother level. Yeah, no, I love that. Um, that's really good. And like, how did you originally get into this? Like, you've got a pretty storied career, which, you know, I'll summarize at the beginning, but like, um, you know, do you just fall into these deals? Like, I, I find a lot of partnership people come from a channel sales background or enterprise sales background, or, you know, they come from corporate strategy and they sort of then go into a bit of a partnership deal. But either way, you're working at pretty senior levels if we're talking those strategic or growth partnerships, right? It's a pretty fundamental layer of business strategy, I almost call it, rather than marketing. Would, would that be a correct assessment? Or? I, I guess so, yeah. I mean, for me personally, the way I fell into it was, I mean, I've, I've, I've um, 
been actively involved in 11 startups since, <laughs> I mean, my career started, you know, I'll date myself, but, you know, my career started back in 1989. That was my first job. So I've been working for a while and I've done 11 startups since like the mid nineties. And the first, the first one where I mean, my, my first partnership ex- experience was, um, my first company was called Exciting Alternatives. And um, the only thing that was really cool about the business was the name of the business. Exciting Alternatives. <laughs> but we were trying to, um, we were, we were launching Garana, you know, the stuff that's in the, yep. the G drink um, yep. um, into, this was back in the early nineties and we were launching that into, so when it first came to Australia, it was just like a big bag of ground up seed. And we were basically distributing it through um, through cafes and, and nightclubs because it would keep you up at night. They'd ground it up in glasses of milk and give it to you over the bar. And um, so, I, you know, so, so that was like very, very, very first example, right, of go to market for me where there was no marketing budget and there was no cool posters and there was no, there was no internet. And you had to find a way to get your product in front of people. You know, I started by, by giving it to my mates. Um, around at their house, you know, and then we had to try and get it into bars and you, you were kind of doing a partnership with the bar, right? They were taking a bit of a risk that maybe this was cool, maybe it wasn't, you know. But then probably the most, you know, I did a, I did two startups before. My, my third one was called Mymetrix and that was a first generation ad tech startup. And um, that was in like 99 into 2000. And we launched, so we we're an Australian business, really sophisticated multivariate testing solution for digital channels, um, SaaS product, and um, we launched it into into San Francisco, and um, turned out to be the sort of tail end of the dot com boom. But you know, we had to find a way to, to take that to market. And so, over four years, we partnered with um, four different companies, and three of them were, were major digital marketing sort of advertising networks in different parts of the world. So, the, the first one when we went into San, San Francisco, we partnered with two companies. One was called New Canoe. And they were the hot, believe it or not, they were the hottest sort of e-commerce digital marketing shop in San Francisco at that time. You know, we went and, when we launched into San Francisco, we went and set up in their office, you know, and they were going to take, because we, we had the answer to, to how digital marketing would work. You could run these interactive marketing experiments to, you know, we could, we could serve 1,024 variations of a landing page and then dissect what, what worked and what didn't. Um, and so we partnered with those guys and we're in their office, you know, so we did this, this partnership deal with them. We're in their office. We were sitting amongst their team. They were going to take us to all of their clients. And the other, other deal we did, which is also a partnership deal, was with Bain. And Bain was the preeminent, preeminent management consulting firm to the dot-com um, crowd in, in Silicon Valley at the time. Mm-hmm. So they had everyone. They had eBay, Hewlett Packard, um, a bunch of others um, and they basically took a stake in our company through the partner's own personal investment fund they had this e-squad fund where they'd put aside their own salary and invest in they only invested in a couple of companies a year and they invested in us wow and their go-to-market strategy for us was they were going to walk us into every major corporate in america the top five or six whale clans and they would use our product and there's your go-to-market strategy I, i've heard that same promise from every startup investor i've ever spoken to <laughs> All invested business, and I go. promise to, to introduce you to all my network and sell you to everybody, right? <laughs> exactly right. And and the, but these guys are the hottest of the hot. They are the number one guys, like and girls. But um, you know, not not a single client out of either of those partnerships. <laughs> now, it was a unique period in time, right? The dot com collapse happened yep. and everything fell apart. Um, but then we rebooted and went to London. So we came back to Sydney and we rebooted and went to London. And in London, we partnered with two other agencies. So there's a group called Prefero who are still around today. They're pretty, actually pretty big digital marketing agents. Same deal. Partnered with them we, before going into market. We pitched, you know, talked to a bunch of companies. They, they got super excited about our product, super excited about our tech, believed our tech would differentiate them in market. And we went and, you know, based out of their office and um, we were there for like eight months. Didn't sell a single, didn't sell a single pro- sell and, and single why, project. And why is that? Um, what, what, what's the sort of learnings there on those two things? Um, like, is it really kind of pushing things. your products or is it like transference of trust or just like no market product market fit in this case? Or Yeah, so it's, it was two things, right? So it's, it says two, two things. One thing about us and one thing about, you know, the market, I think about these, you know, people who are willing to partner in these, in these contexts, right? So the thing it said about us is we were, we were way too early and way too complicated. So our product was, you know, people were barely doing AB testing. 
you know, it was actually a, it was actually a massive ask to get a banner campaign in market. So when we're rocking up talking about discrete choice modeling, you know, we, our pitch was like, you know, it was horrible. Um, you know, we would basically spend 20 minutes trying to explain to them why um, discrete choice marketing experiments by, that delivered revealed preference were far superior to conjoint state of preference surveys. And, you know, we weren't even on, on digital marketing at that point, you know, so we just, we, we were just, we didn't read the market. Our, our product was too complicated. We're out of our time. We're trying to sell, we're trying to educate at the same time as sell. So that's, that's yeah. all about us. <laughs> and, but about partners, right? It hasn't really changed, right? This in the 22 years since then, I still encounter it all the time today, you know, which is why I learned so much at Uber, which is everybody wants to part it with the new coolest, hottest, sexiest thing. And, and we were hot and sexy. There's no question. That's why the Bain guys invested in us. Yeah. But, you know, they couldn't read the room either. So they just thought all of their, everybody overestimates how easy it will be to close a sale, how differentiating this solution will be. You know, it's that's the mistake you see. Pa these partnerships just go from a sort of a buzz and excitement and shared values and shared vision and you're cool and we're cool and we, we match up all this way and then the rubber hits the road and it all falls apart. Yeah. I mean, I've personally done this as well multiple times and exactly the same experience. Mm -hmm. I'm like, the only solution I found was to make it really easy to sell, um, easy to understand, easy to sell, easy to implement easy to use, really clear value proposition. And then the challenge is sometimes if you're selling through the agency, for example, in your case, or another intermediary, you've then got to train them to sell it. So they have to be able to sell it as good as you can. Like you can come on a co-joint call or a sales meeting together and sort of act as partners, but like you've got to have the whole thing packaged up on a platter to give to somebody else, then train them on a platter to then give to somebody else and sell it to them. Until you get to that stage, I find it just doesn't work. Um, because they can't sell it as well as you can. And and sometimes you can't sell it well anyway to start with. So then it just yeah, like, that's, yeah. yeah. That's, that's exactly, and that's why it's so rare. So, you know, particularly yeah. technology-based products or, or anything that's complicated, you know, it's, it's, it's important because in, and particularly in the early stages, so if you're a startup, mm. right, you, you don't have necessarily product market fit and or credibility. So, you know, expecting anybody else to, you know, and so, you know, it's, it's always true people by people. So, you know, your first sales are going to come through those, you know, founder sales are super important and, you know, everybody overestimates how, how quickly you'd be able to move from founder sales to sort of scaling a sales team. Partnerships yeah. are no difference, right? So if, if you couldn't scale a sales team to do it, then you're never going to be able to get a partnership to work if, <laughs> if that's what they're, you know, selling. Yeah, no, I love it. Um, and so, and also just on that note, I mean, uh, we we're just talking about some some prospects. So you worked with an agency, you worked with an investment firm who were then consulting to someone. So yeah, I think you know, this part of the discussion touches on distribution in a services sense. Um, and a lot of, uh, I think people don't talk about this and that's why I wanted to talk to you because a distribution for services often goes through reseller or wholesalers and networks and partnerships. It's like, it's quite messy. It's not like, um, you know, you have a retail product, goes into a warehouse, goes to a wholesaler, sell direct, like bang, Bob's your uncle. But same thing happens with services or can happen. Uh, you know, integrations, mm -hmm. package deals into phone plans, for example, you know, you get a, you know, a discount off, I don't know, whatever this other subscription is, maybe it's Uber. Um, and, and I find like thinking about distribution that way is really interesting because then you start exploring oh, actually, what's within our supply vertical from start to finish, uh, you know, um, all the way up to the end customer? And then, okay, what are the other adjacent sort of uh, horizontals that we can kind of grow across or or other companies that we may have not even thought of that have overlap with our target market that we could approach? Um, so I've got a process for it, but I want to ask from you, I mean, how do you identify potential partners in the first place? Mm, um, so... I mean, there, there, there are no easy solutions. So, so number one rule is never start with the category leader. You know, it's, it might sound a bit trite, but it's true. So you always have to start with the number two player or the challenger. You need someone who's, who, who, who needs a win, you know? Um, yep. So number one is that. Number two is, you know, it's, it's never going to work. At, you, you, you can't go in cold. So you need to, you know, basically to put, again, like we're talking about a 95% fail rate in my experience. So, you know, you're going to need to go in through a trusted, either through a direct personal con relationship or a referral, 
or you find a partner that can take you in. So one of the one of the services success I had is, um, and I had this at Facebook. So um, I um, I basically partnered with PwC, and so I was looking after tech, telco, and entertainment at at Facebook, and um, I did some really innovative and and I'd run the Telstra business at DDV for six years prior to going to Facebook and looking after telco. And ironically, and and we created this incredible um, targeting solution at Facebook for telcos. We could target based on, you know, phone, handset, network, how long they had the plan for, just incredible data targeting. And um, and I couldn't get um, I couldn't get any traction with Telstra. And I ironically I made a lot of traction with, with Optus. So my first sort of real momentum as, as a sales leader at Facebook was doing this innovation based partnerships with Optus. But um, the way that I got into Telstra was I went to PwC and their digital innovation team. And I explained to them the solution that I had in Telco. And basically, they took it to Telstra, you know, yeah, and thanks. because Telstra had heard the story. And, you know, to be fair to them, they're number one in the category. It was the same old thing, right? I had this incredible breakthrough solution, but they're used to doing the business in a certain way. They yeah. don't need it. They don't need a, a you know, a, a trajectory change of win. They're, they're sort of like, they're, they're sort of a bit, bit skeptical about what they'd heard about Facebook to that point. So there's a whole lot of barriers. So at that point, pivot to a third party who's hugely respected in there and equip them to do the sale and they sold it in, you know, and that's, and I carried that through to a couple of other businesses that I was in where I would go, through the, you know, so that's an example where a, where a services business can absolutely open the door for you. So I think the, my two, my two, the two number one thing, well, the three things are, the three things are you're never going to win with a, with a category leader first out. You're going to have to find a way in that's a warm way in. Um, and basically, you know, you just have to double down, triple down on what the win is for them. So, you know, just whales have a view that they are market makers and largely that's true. And whether it is or not, it doesn't matter because that's the view they have. So if inside that organisation, if anybody thinks that it's a bit too weighted towards the startup, the deal will get killed. You'll never yeah. know why, but it could get killed on 20 different dimensions. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's funny you said, um, you know, 95% don't work, right? And, and I think I commented, I had a bit of banter with you the other week uh, on social media about, you know, partnerships sort of remind me of that salesperson who's always about to close the big deal, but, you know, never does. <laughs> and I find partnerships have a very high failure rate as well. They have these very long negotiation phases and everybody's on board. And then it's sort of like, legal gets involved and every, because it touches every single department, um, often at, at both companies, um, you know, they, they could just have this extended sort of like maceration over years and then it just falls apart. And I was working in Silicon Valley for a, for a startup and they were trying to do a partnership with Yelp at the time. And, um, you know, this ex consultant was, you know, going to close the big deal and, you know, two, two years later, well, still hasn't closed. And I think it's been scuttled, but you know, it's all full of promise to start with. And, and why do you think sort of those failures happen like is it just some of the things you mentioned before is there any sort of like do's and don'ts here in particular that can avoid failure yeah i mean look i think the um the um the things i mentioned before obviously but the um one of the things that people buy on emotion right and and the and they they buy ideas they don't buy strategies mm -hmm. And so even with big partnerships, I've had a lot of success with this and I learned this in advertising, you know, the, the advertising world, the absolute masters at, um, you know, cause it's all we do, right? We sell ideas. Yep. And so when you sell an idea to a client and they're the most fragile things in the world, right? An idea can be um, broken apart, you know, die a thousand cuts. Um, so, a, but a really powerful idea when you pitch an idea to a, to a client and they just light up around it, you know, I did this thing for um, Telstra years ago where we, you know, they were going to, um, they were, it was the Olympics, the London Olympics, and they were, they were the key sponsors and, and, and we pitched them and they already had the base of their sponsorship strategy worked out for what they were going to do and how they're going to activate. And, um, and I thought it was, and we, we kind of thought it was lame what they were going to do. And, um, so we pitched them this idea, which was basically, it was like, look, this is the Super Bowl moment for you. And you have to, you're going to have all this airtime on Channel 9. You have to have something that lights people up. And so we're going to re-record Land Out Under. And that's the idea. 
Right? And so we pitched this idea of re-recording Land Down Under and the Super Bowl moment and everybody's going to love what your brand does at halftime, you know? And, and, so, and that sort of thing, right, can survive a thousand cuts. Okay. Because everybody mobilizes rent. I want to be part of that. You know, the first big deal I sold for Uber was, was with Optus and we did Uber umpire on Australia Day where you could get a test cricket umpire delivered to your backyard. To you, to to overs, to your backyard to, cricket, to overs his backyard cricket, yeah, what, like a and real was, umpire, was, like it was tight. yeah, a real test cricket umpire. <laughs> it was umpire on demand, and um, but it was much bigger. It was it was ten times bigger than anything that ever been done by Uber before, and everybody bought into that. You know, so for me, the um, you know, if you if you don't, I think that's the number one differentiator, right? You need to find a way to electrify, you, and you you do it through an idea. And so, what the ad guys do, ad guys and girls do, is they name the idea. So a strategy gets a name. It's still just a strategy, right? But it's it ends up kind of like called an project, idea. like operation, whatever, or project, whatever. Yeah, well, whatever. You know, I did I did this one for Canon when I was at Facebook, and um, it was they were launching a DSLR, and we had to go out and and pitch our media plan to 20 people from the agency and, and Canon. And our, our idea was sunsets, you know, everybody likes sunsets. Of, well, exactly right. And you just like, well, what the hell is that about? You know? And so it was just a normal media strategy, right? It had a thousand different moving pieces, but the strategy was, you know, no one cares about DSLRs because they've got a phone in there. They've got a camera in their pocket. Right? The only time a DSLR shines is in low light conditions. The, the one of those is sunsets. You're going to own sunsets in newsfeed, right? And everybody just gets and and we started the pitch with um, I don't know if you know the Powderfinger song Sunsets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's so we we started the pitch with that. So we're out there to present a media plan. We said we've got an idea for you. Yeah, yeah. We've got the media plan, but we've got an idea. And I'm like, does anybody want to hear our idea? And the whole room's silent. And nobody said anything. That's a guess. I was, I'm still standing up and go, but, but it's a really cool idea. Does anybody want to hear it? And somebody finally said, yeah, I want to hear your idea. And I said, great. It's called Sunsets. Ross, play the music and boom. We haven't even started anything. And, and Powderfinger's screaming out Sunsets. And then we just, and so out of that meeting, everybody in that room went back to their desk, went home that night. and Stewed they could, on the they, idea. Yep. Yeah, and they could and they could say, "Oh, we're going to do this thing called sunsets with Facebook." Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and suddenly we we got like, you know, probably ten x what we would have got out of the media budget for that idea. The same strategy would have just, you know, would, would have, it's would it's have. funny. I've noticed the same thing. I mean, I, I think you know everyone underestimates. This is perfect Peter Thiel quote about uh, everyone ignoring the importance of sales in their whole life um, and undermining it when it's so essential to everything that we do. And um, I think internally as well, like if you have a project internally, giving it a name and then selling it up the chain and getting people on board creates this magnet. And like, if it could be a really like commercially viable thing, but you've got to sell it internally as well and get people in and, and in an emotional sense. And like sometimes calling it an idea like that and branding it is, is a perfect idea. So yeah, that's, that's got me thinking about how to present things. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've had amazing success with that. You know, it's stadium of little fans for Telstra, you know, like they, they want to know what that is, you know, it yeah. just sounds cool. I want, you know, I want to be part of that. So it's, it's, it's amazing how that can, um, you know, that can win, win with, um, with partnership strategy as well. If you, if you don't have it, if you haven't branded it in some way and you, ha you can't energize people about it and they can't get emotionally engaged in it in some way, then all the, that's why all the reasons it can die, you know, We'll, we'll eventually catch up with you. Okay, so um, speaking about Peter Thiel, um, here's the sort of question that I ask everyone. It's like, think about partnerships uh, in particular. Um, what is something about partnerships that everyone believes, uh, but you know to be wrong? Something that everybody believes. That you know, the sort of common orthodox view about partnerships, but actually in your experience, you know, actually it doesn't work like that or that's completely false. Um. I mean, we've probably mentioned a couple already. <laughs> yeah, we probably have. I mean, look, I, I think I'm going to the, um, you know, like in the, okay, so product led growth is something that everybody just believes is, is the holy grail, right? And, and, the <laughs> product teams, and the product teams are the smartest ones in the room, right? Yep, so, yep, yep, um, yep. you know, um, 
but <laughs> I believe that that is that is um, can be just as wrong as anything else. So you know, I, I remember when um, when I was at Uber and there was this flagship product integration between Uber and Facebook Messenger, and everybody was excited about that. As you, as you would expect, right? Messengers in billions of handsets around the world. And you're going to be able, or able to order an Uber from Messenger yeah. without, leave, without leaving the Messenger app, right? And um, I remember hearing it and I'm going, wow, that's epic. Um, how would that work exactly? And, um, and you come back to the same old thing, right? Well, so the use case is um, you're all... You're going to the pub with your friends and you're all meant to be there at seven o'clock and you've all ordered Ubers in the app and the chat's open and you can see whether Brent who's running late, whether he's really on time or not, because you see where he's on his Uber trip. And I'm like, I don't think I want someone to see where I am in my Uber. <laughs> I'm probably late because I'm not coming. You know? um, so like it just, it, at that point, right, it just fell up. I just like, that's, you know, and don't get me wrong, right? I wasn't the guy who, who who truly understood at that point, right, that this wasn't going to work. But in retrospect, it made a lot of sense to me, right? So the persona testing, the use casing, right, just didn't stack up. Hmm. So you know, that's probably probably one of the ones that um, I, I didn't see another distribu product distribution partnership work um, at Uber apart from Google Maps, which is just an absolute game changer. Yeah, so yeah, it's they're, they're super hard to make. This work. It's, it's funny because uh, I think one of the people I really respect, um, he's like, oh, like the people, what people don't understand about product led growth is it's actually product and marketing led growth. And it's like the best PLG actually is marketing and product working together in a large proportion of marketing. And it's like all the best product people I know are always about getting customer feedback, putting that back into reverse feedback. And I'm like, yeah, you're doing market research. That's, that's marketing on a product level. Like, <laughs> but there's this, uh, I don't know, for some reason in tech where there's this product over here and then there's, you know, marketing or growth over here and they sort of just don't really connect with each other. And then, you know, product starts creating these product marketing roles. And I'm just like, that's just marketing. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just, it's all got pretty, pretty complicated these days, like the distinction between all those things and where they see it. And, yeah. I mean, at the, at the end of the day, you know, brand is just a collection of product experiences. You know, they're all totally interrelated from, from my perspective. And, you, you know, you can only tell a powerful brand story if the product experience are consistently delivering an amazing thing for people. And um, you can't reverse engineer it, but then you can't, but if you don't amplify it properly with the right storytelling, then it sort of, it doesn't, it doesn't really turbocharge it either. So. Yeah, exactly. Well, um, just a couple of questions to finish um, that I ask everybody. Um, what's a book that you're reading or have read recently that's really sort of changed your mind or way of thinking for the better that you'd recommend other people read? Jeez. Um, so I'm not much of a reader, but, um, and it's not on point, but I, I've been reading a, um, a spiritual book for the last, every day for the last two years, one chapter every day for two years um, mm -hmm. called I Am That by Sri Nizagadatta. And uh, it's, been, it's been quite transformative. Okay, and and what sort of like vibe is that? Is that like a meditation thing or like a? Yeah, it's 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 a it's a um, well, so it's based on um, he's an Indian guru um, who's perceived to be a, a self realized individual, and um, it's it's one hundred and one chapters, and it's basically someone going. It's it's a dialogue between him and somebody who goes and sits with him, and is basically seeking, you know a relief from suffering, you know, the eternal answers. And it's just a dialogue between him and the other person. And um, there's just, a, there's just a handful of themes that come through again and again and again, you know, that base. And for me, like letting go acceptance, none of it really matters. We're here for a short time, you know, chop wood, carry water. Um, don't get caught up. Don't sweat the detail, you know, like I'm, yeah. I'm sort of like, Make it paraphrasing for, for this audience, but you know, man, like I, I actually earnestly believe that 85% of what we do in marketing and, and growth and partnership doesn't, isn't going to make any difference. Um, and, and, and so it's the 15% that will change the game and, and it's often hard to work out what that is. So, you know, we, we just spend so much time agonizing over, um, over stuff that you just need to sort of get it, get it out. And get it you know, I said that recently, actually, in a, in a tweet, I was like, look, you know, uh, really good marketing is just like an exercise in failure. But the problem is, it's sold on the opposite, complete opposite ratio. It's like, this will definitely work. So then you get this like eternal 
um, disappointment uh, and this mixed match of expectations versus reality that then everyone goes, oh, well, marketing didn't work. But I'm like, if you, if you go into it going, actually, most of this is not going to work, but some of it will, and some of it will change the business. And once you're prepared to waste a lot of money and resources, this is the name of the game, but the good stuff will iterate on, we'll, we'll know what not to do, and we'll go in these sort of growth cycles, and we'll get there in the end. And it's like a very different mindset to let's put all eggs in this campaign and it's going to work, it's going to work. And then, you know, generally it doesn't, um, very rarely does it. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think, you know, there's, there's teams that sort of have that, that mindset or, or the other. So anyway. Yeah. And, and that used to be me, you know, I used to be super opinionated. I used to be very difficult to work with. I used to be a pain in the ass. And, <laughs> you know, I used to believe that my opinions were, were, were more valid than others. And, um, did you work in an ad agency or something or? Well, you know, I work everywhere, but, uh, you know, it's just been, just been more recent because I've been older, you know, I, I just see yeah. the value in, in slowing down a bit and, and letting everyone have their say and, and, you know, just testing lots of stuff. And it, it is that indefin, it's that indefinable thing, you know, great partnerships, great marketing, great product decisions, you know, they're those indefinable things, you yeah. know, there's a level of science and data around it, but you're always going to have to make these intuitive calls at certain points. And you're always going to have to respond. You're going to have to make these decisions based on experience and feel and and things like a momentum and emotion. And you know those things are what guide you to what you should be doing more of and what you should be doing less of. You know, and and I think I think we get if we get if we're too too wound up about it, too serious about it, you know, we we probably miss miss the opportunity stuff. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, what about, um, I think it's a great answer. What about a favorite website, uh, website resource that you'd recommend other people learn about? Um, so for me, it's, um, it's sort of like the web three crossover thing. So I, I did this, um, fellowship program called kernel last year, which is a fellowship program on a web three. And, um, you know, I had no, I had, you know, I'm fully in Web3 these days and I've been doing it for about a year. And at that point, I had very little experience or understanding of crypto or blockchain or tokens or what it all meant. And um, I did, I, I applied for this program. It's about 250 people get selected in each block. I did kernel block four. And um, it's this hybrid, um, it's like one third, um, one third academic program, one third accelerator program one third spiritual program and it just covers everything about open decentralization the history of money value meaning wow um, and you work in this sort of like really collaborative pro process so i did that program and all of the content is completely available to anybody so anyone can apply for the next block but equally you can just go and access the content and do the all the it's all recorded there's all the all the readings it's just it's just the most one of the most transformative things that I've done and sort of like an educational experience thing. Um, so yeah, I'd highly recommend that. That's Kernel. an awesome. That's K E R, a... K -E -R N E L from, uh, get from Gitcoin. Oh, that's great. Um, it kind of reminds me of like reforge, but in a sort of web three context. Uh, yeah, very like much so. yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. like that, but more spiritual. <laughs> great. I love it. Um, what about a piece of tech that helps you do your job better? It could be software or hardware. Um, Piece of tech that helps me do my job better. God, I'm the worst person to ask this. Um, <laughs> you know, I just like Zoom. <laughs> okay, no, it's fine. Just <laughs> matter. Um, okay, what about um, what about over to you? Uh, what do you want to sort of promote and get the word out there about? Um, look, I just think you know. I mean, obviously, Smart Token Labs, we, we made token smart. So we're here, we're here to help. We're here, here to help connect brands between Web 2 and Web 3. But, um, you know, the main thing is just probably at a personal level. You know, I think I think in today's world, the um, the gap between experience and opportunity has never been narrower. So, you know, just you, particularly the, all the new Web 3 stuff, like, you know, I've been through Web, Web 1, Web 2, Web 3 now and all sorts of different startups. It's always a bit confronting. You know, none of us ever know. The best thing you can do is have a bias to action and just get involved and do something. You know, don't be afraid of not knowing. Um, but, you know, I don't think it's ever been the case. This is really what, you know, this next iteration is about, this more open open internet, right? Opportunity is more accessible than it's ever been before. Learning and experience is more, you can you can get it in a bite-sized way. You, know, you can do fractionalised involvement. You can get involved in an NFT project or a DAO. And you can just... You know, you can gather experience, which is going to be a springboard for opportunity to do all sorts of different things. And that's 
that's just what I really encourage people to do. You know, I think there's if you, if if you don't have to be stuck in anything for too long. Um, and you can enrich whatever you're doing by just getting a bit more experience in something else. Yeah, no, exactly. I'm a big fan of getting my hands dirty, like, you know, like this, uh, just teach myself podcasting, talk to somebody, you know, to start it up and you just kind of learn by okay. doing and, you know, you're going to fail. It's going to look shitty at the beginning, but eventually you kind of get better and you talk to more people and they're like, oh, they give you a recommendation to do this and you're like, oh, I'll tweak this or that's a great idea. You know, I'll put that in and you then. Must have so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I remember sort of going at the beginning about podcasting going like, what the hell is an RSS thing? And like, why are we using them for for podcasting? Like, isn't that some old school news thingy? And I was like, I was just so confused. I'm like, what the hell is this? And um, I'm like, it's just an MP3 that people, you know, listen to. It's audio. Like, why does this have to be so complicated? And then you go into this, like, other world. And, you know, one of the things, interesting things I found out about is that this mix match that people don't understand the podcast medium at all. Like, the long tail trailing effect from listeners on the episode. I've got this graph that's just amazing, like, to look at. Um, and then just the the quality of the people who listen to podcasts those people don't always watch youtube so you're either a youtube mm. podcaster or you're an audio podcaster and so coming back to use cases like yeah. you'll get people that only listen to podcasts on a walk or at the gym and those people don't won't be watching a computer screen right so then i'll get these people going oh you need to put your things on youtube because that's how i watch my podcast and i was like okay um and you know just all this like intricacy um and, and then you know everyone uses their own little platforms and so much more complex than I ever thought uh, possible. But um, yeah, it's just amazing. You'll get very high quality people, you know, dedicating an hour of their time to listen to something. Um, and yeah, some of these are senior. Easy. Yeah, and these are senior executives, busy people. Like, so to take an hour of their spare time away from everything else that, you know, kids and everything is is a huge ask. And, um, but there's some people just like, that's that's what they get off on and they love it. So um, anyway, that's kind of why I do it. So um, yeah, anyway, I just want to thank you again. Um, is there is there any way uh, in particular, if people really resonate with what we're talking about today that they can get in contact with you or? Yeah, I mean, just I mean, I'm LinkedIn's the main medium for me, so I'm just Brent Annals on LinkedIn. There's not many people called Annals, A W N E W L S, so you'll find me, Brent Annals. Um, or you know, if you want to follow our project, you know, we're we're at TokenScript um, on Twitter. Okay, great, and uh, thanks for your time, um, Brent. I really appreciate it, and um, yeah, let's let's chat again soon. Fantastic, thanks for having me, mate.